Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, I want to talk about feelings today. And, you know, there is something I think um, remarkably powerful about simple forms, right? When we have removed everything non essential from an object to the extent that if we remove anything more, we're going to obstruct the entire design of it, right? And at that point, we can reach this sort of distinct clarity that can be awe-inspiring at points, right? And this is, of course, the philosophy that a lot of us operate under in a Western uh, society when we design. But this is sort of my tale about how I've had to question that to some extent when I started working at a game company. As Un said, there's many rules that are different, and sometimes the rules are not there at all. So this talk is called, Where Do All the Feelings Go? And it sort of explores this question that slowly raised when I started working at Mojang. So um, here's the basic thesis. Right now, we're in this utilitarian design paradigm, right? And maybe overly so. Uh, we focus on how to create utilities, right? As in, we focus on the function and not as much on how you feel while you're using those utilities and performing those functions. Okay, so um, if you think, yes, that's obvious, and that's obviously true, good, that's why we need to talk. So this is, to back, take a step back, not a talk on like skeuomorphism versus flat, but that's a heated debate, and I want to sort of use that to set the context for what sort of talk this actually is. So if you remember, skeuomorphism is when we use physical objects to mimic some sort of thing to create a feeling, right? That's the point. You create a feeling with skeuomorphism. So we had this, we had beautiful bookshelves, we had calendars, and we had Find My Friends with some leather stitching or something. And it was, I think, I'm not going to bash it, or maybe I just did, but I'm not going to defend it either. It's tacky within a game design too. But I think if you think that what happened, as especially as we moved from iOS 6 into this other realm that we are now in, as a move from like skeuomorphism where we had um, skeuomorphic elements, materials gradients, it was really playful, and we had a lot of textures, and then we moved away and into like minimalism flat, uh, authentic, elegant design. I think if we think of that transition in this way, we miss sort of a lot of nuance in that discussion. So instead, how I like to think about it is if we draw a spectrum from expressive, as in how much we try to express a feeling with the design, to utilitarian on the other perspective, we're right now, and then we add, an, add another axis, which is complex to minimalistic, we can sort of start to map things out. Okay, so let's start here. Windows, okay, that's a complex, usually they, they surface more complexity, right? It's not um, bad necessarily, it's a design decision. They surface more complexity, but they are still extremely utilitarian, right? So they may have a flat design language, but there's a lot of things going on. Now in this quadrant here, we'd have something like Civilization, right? A strategy game that is extremely expressive. And if you hadn't had this, you basically simulate the entire society and history of mankind, which is pretty complex, but it's extremely engaging and fun, right? So they are here in this corner uh, down here. Now, up there, we've got like elegant, simple games like Threes, for example, extremely fun, but yet minimalistic and elegant. And now I think what, how it used to be, right? iCal used to be here. Apple, in their design language, used to value almost um, expressiveness as much as functionality, right? And that's why they focus so much on all these weird details, like to give us a sense of feeling, a certain feeling when using their apps. Then, of course, what happened was that they removed that. Boom, we moved to another design language, which is extremely flat and functional. Now, what I think is interesting is that we can occupy this space in other ways than through skeuomorphic design, and that's what I think is actually interesting. So let's take an example, right? So um, how would a utilitarian text app look like? A less utilitarian, sorry. Okay, so let's start with a utilitarian one. Let's remove these. Let's add text edit. Extremely, like, flat, boring, functional, yes, app. Looks like this, perfect. Now, how does a text writing experience look like if we go into this quadrant? You might remember this app. This is one of my 
favorite apps in a way. It's called OmRider. Here's me using it. So it takes over your entire screen, plays you some background music. It fades the UI away as soon as you start typing. You have a background image. You got weird sound when you type. And they built it basically to create a sort of mood, right? They want you to relax, to shut things out, to enter a certain mindset while typing. OK? That's what they're after. You can like change some pictures. You can change the sound. It's not skeuomorphic, right? Skeuomorphic is, is trying to imitate a typewriter, for example. They're not doing that. They're creating an original new experience by being extremely expressive through their design language. Omrider with two Ms is very nice. I would place that in this coordinate right here. So my point is sort of that as we moved with iOS 6, as I think a community more towards flat design and this way of expressing ourselves, I personally forgot that simple easy to use is not in conflict with as expressive and engaging. And I mean, I didn't forget it rationally. I could still think the same way that I used to do, but I started designing in a different way. So practically, I forgot it, right? I started designing in a very, um, like, strict way, overly elegant and overly serious. I did not want to create playful design, right? It needed to be more like Jonathan Eve, being very harsh about simplicity. So I've divided the rest of this talk into three main subjects. One, um, the current sort of dogmas that we do have right now in design, and then what we can learn from games, some practical examples, and then how we move towards expressiveness if you would like to do so. Let's start with this. So when we talk about this, I think it's important, first of all, to talk about dogmas, right? And dogmatism has nothing to do with dogs, sadly, or they would, this would be a very different kind of talk. Uh, I love to talk about that, but dogmatism is essentially the tendency to lay down principles as incontrovertibly true without consideration of evidence. Right? And I think this is interesting for us, because as soon as we design something, it's an, we have an implicit prediction in that design. Right? We say, we believe that designing it this way rather than this way is better because of a reason. We may not actually define that reason, but there's an implicit prediction in that if we put effort into our idea, things will become better. And there's a really recent, um, not recent, interesting research study on uh, making good predictions, right? So this took place over 20 years. They enlisted over 300 people with PhDs and whatnot. And they, um, it's called the Good Judgment and Political Forecasting Study by Philip Tetlock. It's extremely interesting. Uh, and just to summarize it very lightly, uh, what they did was they asked people questions like, will candidate X in country X, Y, sorry, that's not the same, win the election within this time frame? And they had a limited time frame. Okay? So then uh, people could answer yes or no to all of these questions and supply a confidence level. So by doing that over 20 years, they were able to, by looking at those numbers, find not just a correlation, but a causal relationship between a certain personality trait and making good predictions of how things would turn out. Very relevant for us, I think, as all we're doing is making uh, predictions. And um, spoiler, it's not IQ, right? They had a, th a hypothesis that IQ would be a significant driver of making good predictions, but it's not. So what is? Well, dogmatism leads to poor judgment. They define dogmatism in this way. Some key characteristics, highly opinionated, simple answers to difficult questions, confident in ability to judge, have one view of the world, change that r changes the rules of proof to fit that view. Right? It can be very difficult to argue with a person like that. And then they looked for facts to prove themselves right. Okay, so if you behave in that way, you can tend to sort of miss the point. Now, the opposite is true for having good judgment, okay? So if you have a nuanced view of things, you have better judgment. And that's basically the polar opposite. So they found that um, carefully weighing proofs for and against, uh, complex answers to difficult questions, like if you can answer why Donald Trump won the election in a sentence, that's a simple answer to a very difficult question, right? So, 
the nuanced people that they found, they, had, they didn't want to judge, right? They didn't want to give simple answers to difficult questions. They were also confident in the ability of judging. It's very difficult. They upped their belief and presented with evidence, and they looked for facts to prove themselves wrong. And I think when you see this, it's like, nobody behaves this way. That's impossible. We'll want to, but it's impossible. But they found that people actually did in certain circumstances. So if you visualize this, um, they call them hedgehogs, the defensive sort of people that had poor judgment, and they call more nimble and flexible people foxes. Okay, so if you visualize that, I think if a hedgehog has an idea and then you're presented with new evidence, over time you have the same idea. Okay, nothing changes. That's dogmatism. If you're a fox, you work very much in the way that we work with design in many times, right? It evolves over time. So if you have one of the one idea of how the world works, and then you're presented with new evidence, and then you have two conflicting beliefs, and they both can't be true, right? Like you have two A-B tests, or two versions of a test, they can't both be better, but one of them is probably true, and then as you get new facts, you get more beliefs, and they all can't be true, but you manage to keep it all in your head, right? Here's the problem, and the kicker, sort of. In every sort of uh, context where we put people on a stage or put people on TV, we want people with strong opinions. Okay? It's very interesting with people with strong opinions. It would be very um, frustrating if you had debate and everyone in Gothenburg were just sitting there and saying, well, yeah, it depends. That's a difficult question. Ah, uh, it would be the worst TV, right? So let's take an example. Um, this is my former uh, boss, um, Steve Ballmer. Uh, CEO, a former CEO of Microsoft, he said this, uh, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share, no chance, it's a $500 subsidized item. Oh, Steve. Um, just a quick show of hands, if you would help me. So, like, how wrong do you think this is? If you think it's totally off, do a thumbs down. If you think it's somewhat right, do a middle thumb for me right now, and then if you, it's, it's right, do thumbs up. Join me in this quickly, okay. Right? It's, it's pretty off. Okay, so let's actually dig into this. So here's the full quote. Um, it's sort of a funny question. Would I trade 96% of the market for 4% of the market? Laughing. I want to have products that appeal to everybody. Okay, so now we'll get the chance to go through this again. He's referring to iPod here, right? When they just got the entire market really quickly. Uh, then the actual quote, then he says, they may make a lot of money, but if you actually take a look at 1.3 billion phones that get sold, I'd prefer to have our software in 60 or 70 or 80 percent of them than I would to have two or three. Okay, let's look at the actual numbers. Five years after he said this, I think that's a fair time frame to judge him by. Um, iPhone was actually hovering around 20 percent. I think that's less than I would spontaneously put it at because maybe in Sweden it's higher and my circle of friends all have iPhones, so. But it's around 20%, most often under, to be honest. So, and if we also look at this quote, this is really interesting. They may make a lot of money. He's really pinpointing here Apple's strategy, to be fair, right? They're not after market share. He's saying he wants to make products for everyone, and then he's saying, well, they may make a lot of money. That's true, that's what Apple does, right? They sell expensive products for a smaller part of the market, and they make huge profits. So given, given that nuance, just like one raise of hands, what do you think? Is he totally off or somewhat right? Yeah, yeah maybe middle, right? Okay, let's do this again. So if you actually look at the 1.3 billion phones that get sold, you know what that is? That's actually the entire phone industry that he's talking about. Okay, so we used to have feature phones, they're getting smaller, but uh, like Nokia phones, right? And here we see smartphones. So 2007 is around the time when iPhone launched and when he said this, and Apple has 20% of that. Here's a graph of um, Apple's share around that time. We see iPhone here growing from 2007 to this much. Guess, guess the title of this article. The iPhone share, 4% of all phones. So, his prediction was around 4. In 2010, it was 4. The year after was 5, not because Apple's share increased, but because feature phones sell so less. Right? And that is also, that change is like dropping off as we go, right? So I think considering that, how correct was he actually in his quote, right? I think it was pretty much spot on. 
he totally reads Apple in the situation correctly, which doesn't mean that they reacted correctly at Microsoft, but it means, of course, that he was to a large extent right. And I think this is the issue. We judge people very quickly. We see this Steve Ballmer guy, and we have seen videos of him with like sweaty armpits and screaming developers. Of course, he has poor judgment, and we judge him extremely quickly. This is John F. Kennedy. He says, he said, for the great end of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears, we subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations, and we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Right, so I think this man is a big issue, not because he can make very stupid decisions, but also because he's so obviously dogmatic that it, it means that we, we have to be right, right? He's so wrong, we have to be right in comparison. And I think he's pushing us in this direction of slight dogmatism, right? It's, it's, it's a scale from nuance to dogma. And of course, he is on one opposite end, but I think we're not as nuanced as we think we are. So what are some dogmas currently in design? Some things that we apply in our design, but it may actually not be true or proven to the extent that we think it is. Here's one, clean is better. There's actually a very interesting article on that clean is uh, this assumption, clean is better, by Jonas Downey at Basecamp. I would highly recommend that you read this. Um, he sort of uh, talks about mess interfaces, right? So he goes on just to summarize his main points. He shows us this photo and he says, probably you're designing something like this right now. And then he says, well, a lot of the designs like this have, come, have become so commonplace that beautiful and clean are almost baseline constraints for new projects. It's like every designer had the same printer's coffee shop, fever dream, and decided the whole world has to become lifestyle chic. Right? And then, I think as a point, and then it says, well, and that makes sense, right? Uh, everyone likes easable, digestible things that look bright and stylish. Nobody wants this ugly stuff, or do they? And then he lists some of the most popular services, like Craigslist, Photoshop, which is actually a really good application, and then Facebook, which is not at all simple, right? And it's so easy to, in this circumstance, when you see this, think like, oh, but surely it's despite the complexity that they are popular, right? But we don't know that. We actually don't know that. So here's another one. Minimal is better. It's sort of the same thing. Another one is utility is prior number one. We design for utility and not for feelings. Less friction accomplishing a task is better. That's sort of an assumption that we usually have. And then what I want to talk about more is that one and this one. What user accomplishes is more important than how a user feels doing that. So you might also be thinking at this point, I think dogmas is like an exaggeration. We're free to think whatever we want. Well, personally, what happened was that I did not feel like I was living in a dogma, but when I entered the gaming industry, I'm like, oh, I'm free to think. <laughs> the, the rules were so different. And to me, that is an indication of actually a dogma uh, or a very strong paradigm that it's difficult to question that it is in place. So let's, let's take a step back and think about this. How do you create a great shopping experience? And let's focus on a physical store first, right? So the Apple stores are very well designed. I'm going to show you a short clip um, internally produced at Apple and how they talk about their shops. Now I want you to think about the, the nuance they have about or they focus on talking about both utility and how people feel and the local culture. All our stores have the same elements, but what sets apart the significant stores are their locations, which are typically the most important in that city, and the architecture. It's about getting out into the street, feeling what the locals feel, and then trying to unlock that which they miss themselves. Once we decide it's the right location, the challenge becomes, what are you gonna paint there? What kind of store do you wanna do? And we like all types of stores. You know, at times, it's something very modern, like we did at Fifth Avenue, or on the Upper West Side. And at times, it's something very historic, like our store on Regent Street in London. When we talk about significant stores, they're really about bringing something special to a community beyond what they've had before. 
they end up being something that yeah is marketing but still so then let's look at app store okay how the same company designed the app store so this is me yesterday uh finding an app and finally they had released angry birds m match i think yes um, so I go into the store and I have this button saying get and I press it and I install and I get this um, confirmation dialog thing after a while. Yes. Thank you. And then you wait and you wait and you wait. This actually took like several minutes, but eventually it goes from this stop button, it just says stop to open. Okay. That's the buying experience. So. I think if, if you think about like how to create a great buying experience and how much did they try, this is sort of how I feel, honestly, when I see this. Like, do you remember buying things as a kid and like unwrapping the plastic and like smelling the things and feeling the things? It's such an emotional experience, or it can be if you try to make it one. So I want to show you an early exploration just to show like the difference between these worlds, like gaming and, and um, startups or products. So here's an early exploration that we did for uh, Minecraft. Now we wouldn't launch this, so it's, it's very rough, but I think you will get the point. We had some guiding hypothesis while doing this. One is um, we can create a more engaging and joyful experience, buying experience, if we focus on the act of getting something rather than the act of spending the money, right? So the act of getting it should be really, really, really important to you. Then two, we believe that we can create a more positive buying experience by using suspension, right? You have this moment before you open it that is like you know you have it, but you haven't got it yet. It's a very powerful moment. You can draw that out to create more, uh, a more effective experience. Then we believe that we can create a more positive buying experience by prominently showcasing what you got after you got it post-purchase, okay? So here's this old exploration. Um, just want to set the context. What you've done here is that you've entered basically a store of contents, you pressed purchase, buy, and you did the purchase, okay? And then you see this. Yay. Right? And I, I'm not here to say, like, you should do this. <laughs> it would not fit your app. Right? But I think that often we stop at making it easy to accomplish the task rather than think about how do you feel when you accomplish this task. And just looking at some games, it's so inspiring, I think, how much thought they put into this. So I want to give you some more examples from other players. Blizzards are very good at this, uh, or is. So they've made a game called Overwatch. In this game, you can open some loot boxes. Thankfully, we have a lot of people streaming doing this, which is like user... Um, research sessions with millions of views, which is really interesting. So I just want to give you a peek at a guy opening some loot boxes, basically a similar experience, like they're getting things. These are just dope as fuck. I love these victory poses with the medals. Oh, 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 gold. All right, let's see what we got. Holy shit, dude. What is this, cricket? Oh my God, that's badass. Oh, that is my favorite Junkrat skin. Look at his hair jiggle. <laughs> All right, I'm enabling that. Haha, <laughs> fuck yeah, dude. All right, 80 to go. 80 to go, All right? He was opening 80 boxes. <laughs> Hyperactive through all of it. And I think that's really interesting, right? It's basically a utility. If we were like thinking with the mindset, we need to reduce the friction, we'd just be like, here are all your stuff. Scroll it through and you're done. Go play, all right? But they don't do that. So here's Hearthstone. It's similar to that. And if you, if you notice what she does in this video, you can even fail opening the things that you got, all right? So you have to like actually perform a task getting things that they could give you automatically. So just look at her actions. It's in German. You won't understand, but you'll, you'll understand. I'm always a real bad bird. And on the newest packs, I'm really happy because there habe ich erst, ich glaube, 20 Packs in etwa geöffnet und habe eine epische LOL. Die ist noch aus den klassischen Standard-Decks. Oh, oh mein Gott! Noch eine epische! <lacht> What? Und oh, das ist so ein Fail, das ist zweimal das Gleiche. Wusste ich gar nicht, dass die davon sind. Hupsi. Dann zwei von... Right, so she even failed performing the task there in the end, right? So 
I think this is interesting. When you focus on how you feel while performing a task, you may end up introducing fiction in order to make it more engaging. And this is sort of opposite of the dogma that I think we all often operate under, that if we remove friction, it's a better experience. So if you, if you, uh, if you look at this again, you might be thinking, oh, do I have to watch that every single time I buy something? Like, and this is a common objection to sort of doing these or creating these sort of engaging experiences, that over time they could just become really tiring and, and reductive, so, or redundant. So, you know, maybe you just want this, but actually that's, that, that comment is a really good hypothesis. Right? Maybe the more you buy something, the less you want to show it. Maybe you can react to that. Maybe they, these two ideas are not at all in conflict. Right? It could be that if it is annoying, you can reduce it over time, or sort of, um, depending on the type of experience that you're building, use it or not use it. You might still be feeling, uh, no, I don't want anything like this inside of my apps. Um, and you don't think that it would fit in your app. Right? I'm not here to tell you, go use all of these effects. They won't fit all of your experiences. But sort of my point is that if we, and I think we should, move towards more expressive interfaces, this is a question that you could ask yourselves. Right? Some, from a spectrum from Minecraft to Excel, like how engaging should your expressive and playful should your experience be? And I think what we tend to do as a community right now, we tend to lean in this direction because it's less scary, right? But I think we need to go further in, in this direction. We don't need to go to, to that opposite end, but maybe somewhere in the middle. Maybe. So if you want to do that, um, one thing that you could do is just like think of the key moments in your app that you could improve by focusing on how users feel. So for, to take an example, like you all use Discover Weekly, maybe, that's, that's an hypothesis. Uh, but if you use Spotify, maybe you use Discover Weekly, every single Monday you get this new playlist. That's a key moment that they could use to like add some playfulness to that, add some engaging animations to show you, hey, both it's new, but also this is a beautiful moment. You'll be looking forward to this for a week. Right? One thing that I also think is very important that to do this, we have to use animations, basically. So we need to learn to define prototypes and our thinking in high fidelity, which means we need to learn those tools. If we don't define design with high fidelity, someone else will do it or just skip it, which often means that a developer will do it or someone that doesn't really care maybe about the end user experience. Learn Framer, if you haven't spent more time with Framer, we use similar tools and this tool a lot within Minecraft to sort of work with how people should feel and how all of the elements should work together. And do play some games. I would highly recommend just sitting down and looking at like the Switch OS that Nintendo just released and how they balance utility and expressiveness. Right, there's a lot of quirky things going on, but it's still highly functional and it's not in conflict, I think, with minimalism or simplicity. And if you take anything from this talk, I think it's that you should, of course, look for facts to prove yourselves wrong. It's not as easy as we think. Um, that's it. I'm Tobias. Uh, thank you very much.